this is Mark Patterson back again with another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, I was very fortunate to be invited up to Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese, his wife, house in Malibu, California, and went through a whole hour of just amazing conversation. This girl has done so much in her life. She was a full ride scholarship player to Florida State. While she was there, she was also modeling in New York, paying the bills. And then she went on, she co-hosted on ESPN. She did something called The Gravity Game. She's been in some movies and she's written three books. So she's a full-time mom, a full-time supporter of Laird, and she's definitely a standalone person on her own, but just a fantastic person. And the kind of the whole magic before any of this started is I drove up there with my best buddy, Jim Mora. And we were invited to go into their pool and train, and not just train, but train with weights. And so they had a bunch of people that were there, pretty cool stuff. Essentially, if you can imagine jumping into a pool with weights ranging from 20 pounds to 35 to 45 pounds and going up and down and taking these breaths and going back down, obviously the weights are dragging you back to the bottom, but they've got a variety of these different hybrid type water exercises, low stress in the body and just really focuses in on your breath and on your strength. And it was really cool. We did this for an hour. We were all over the pool, back and forth. We never were in the pool without a weight. So some pretty dynamic people that were there, some actors, but bottom line, just really cool people. But going back to the pod, it was just really enlightening. One of my more favorite ones I've done, focus a lot on relationships, what I went through, what she's gone through. She's had a very successful run with Laird for the last 20 years, but they had a few bumps and we talk about it. So brave soul for doing that. And I really appreciated it and just made the pod that much more rich. So on that note, as always, I'm hopefully now back from Denali. I taped this the day before I left and now I'm returning and hopefully I can say I successfully made that journey back and forth safely. And if you want to find out anything else, what's going on, public speaking, I just signed up for a TED Talk in Sun Valley. We'll see how that goes. You can find me at www.markpattisonnfl.com. And as always, this broadcast is brought to you by violetsorblueskincare.com. Organic, awesome products to put on your face and your skin. Okay, non-toxic. So check that out. All right. So on that note, let's go talk to Gabby. Here we go. Hey, it's Mark Pattison back again with another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, I find myself in Malibu, California, at the home of Gabby Reese and Laird Hamilton. Gabby, how are you doing? I'm great. And you guys did great. You came, you trained, and then now we get to talk. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because I've never done that before. And you guys are famous, infamous. I'm not sure what (laughs) what is the correct word for that, but all these different pool workouts and weights and everything else. And so we have a common buddy. Steve and Liz Wright. Yes. And so Steve is a guy that I played with many years ago in the NFL with the Raiders. And he's told me about these legendary things where he just gets absolutely cooked. Yeah. And he's one of these guys that was always working the hardest in the weight room and really dedicated. And when he says he's cooked, I was like a little intimidated coming out here. So I'm sitting also to my right, Jim Mora, and we both got in the pool and we're doing the seahorse and we're doing all these other exercises that you guys have come up with. So where did this all come from? Because I've never seen it before in my life. Well, I would imagine that like special ops or Navy SEAL guys have all done versions of this already. Laird always says there's never really new ideas. It's just new applications of old ideas. And for me, I always say he's the creative motor to a lot of things that happen. And he doesn't like to go swimming. He gets bored. Yeah. So we built this big pool. And I think Laird always had the instinct that, hey, we're going to pool train. So Literally how it started is, you know how we've got the incline in the middle of our pool? It used to be, okay, grab really heavy dumbbells, do Hulk jumps down the incline and walk up the stairs, do as many as you can and walk up. And then it was wear a weight vest and sort of tread and just be there as long as you can. And slowly but surely, and you met Hutch and some of the boys today, Darren Aline is not here. He's sort of one of the original. There was like maybe four or five of us. And we were basically kind of like Laird's crash test dummies. Yeah. And it started becoming a creative process. You met one of my daughters, Reese, today. Yeah. When she was five or six, she would do this one-handed swim up from the bottom with a dumbbell. That became a Reese. Sure. So it just became a creative expression. And then it started becoming, well, how do I turn this into 
a workout or do I push my capacity in cardio or am I trying to work on power, strength and explosiveness? So depending on how you wanted to use it was then also how the exercise is in which format. Because like with Steve, when Steve Wright comes here and trains, they go for 90 minutes straight and they're working on, right on the edge the whole time. Sure. So there's a way to ramp it up once you kind of understand some really fundamental things that are important to learn here. Yeah. I've always been a big believer of CrossFit, not necessarily the, the workout CrossFit, yes, but yes. cross training, yeah. right? I now live in Sun Valley, Idaho. And so I'm training at altitude. I'm running up mountains. I'm coming back down to really put that stress and pressure on my thighs. I'm on the bike. So I'm trying to really go across the board yeah. to really allow my body to have longevity and where I'm trying to go and things I'm trying to accomplish. And I think so many people get locked in on just one particular exercise and they do the aerobic, but not the anaerobic, right? Yeah. And so this was just combining all these different things into one with the weights in my hand and yeah. I get out of the water and I feel all gunned up. Yeah. Right? My heart's racing and this underwater breathing. And it was interesting, as you know, because you helped set it up. When I talked to Laird on the pod mm -hmm. a couple months ago, we were talking about his kind of the whole motivation around breath. And because he's in these giganto waves yeah. and the amount of time he has to spend underwater to survive and make sure he puts himself in the best position while at the same time on the complete opposite end, while he's under, I'm up, right? And I'm on these mountains right. that are crazy that have not a lot of oxygen. And so it's all about pressure breathing, going through the nose and out through the mouth. And I have been on so many of these mountains. Every single time we have run into issues with people where they get hypoxia, lack yeah. of oxygen, they don't have enough oxygen flowing through the red blood cells, and they just crash. Yeah. And they look like they're literally punch drunk. It's crazy. Yeah. So this is so important. I really appreciate it because I'm going off to uh, Denali tomorrow. I know. But okay, well, well thank you. And Go ahead. also for people, our whole thing is, you know, Laird has his reasons for training, but then the other idea is how do I train really hard without impacting my joints? And so the other great thing is you're working in a no gravity environment. So I think it's important, like you said, to see as you, especially as you just move through life, how do I continue to do what I love to do or train really hard, but also do it in a way that maybe I just, I'm not completely pounding myself in every workout. So the pool also offers that environment. And the last thing it offers, and you did this very well, was it's the understanding of the power of our emotions and then how they impact the end result. And the pool shows that very quickly. So if I'm ramped up or not relaxed or I'm inefficient, I can't complete the task. And so the pool is also a really great place to learn how to master some of those elements of being a human too. Well, here's how my human spirit came out. So the last exercise that we did was I got, for anybody who's listening, if you can imagine taking two 25-pound weights in your hand with a mask on, submerging yourself, swimming the length of the pool, underwater, on the ground, of course, because the weight has you on the bottom of the pool, mm -hmm. spinning around and coming all the way back. And I got within about 10 feet of the end mm -hmm. and other people in the group had done it and I did not make that successfully. And I was mm -hmm. pissed. I got to tell you. I saw that. Yeah. I was pissed <laughs> and I was frustrated because I don't like to come in second or lose, right? Yeah. But we tried it again. Jim and I went together and we did it twice more. So we did it totally three times. I never made it. And I have to come back when I get back from yeah. Denali and redo this, right? Yeah. And to your point though, the first time I went and you were coaching me through like my breath and everything else, what was blocking me is I kept saying, I can't do this. Because it just looked like I've got to swim that far underwater and come all the way back. So yeah. so then when I turned around and started making, I thought I could make it. And I was then my mindset switched, but then I had put so much energy into trying to get there and back. Yeah. I didn't listen to you in the right way. It's just like, I didn't make it, but it does. It measures a lot of things in your body. Well, and it's like the mountain for you or the waves for Laird. It's also completely objective. Yeah. So it's an opportunity for you as a person to go inside yourself because the rules are always the same for everyone. And so it's the water and a place underneath with no oxygen is a really fair place. It's not picking on anyone. And it's also, you're not getting special treatment. So it's really a very truthful environment to work in. As a person, you can be like, oh, I'm cool or I'm relaxed or I can handle that. And then it's like, okay, well, let's see. So I think I like that element too. Yeah. I know. There's just so many things. I've never done this and I love challenging myself and I love doing it in a way that's low impact on my knees and my joints. Yeah. 
And all those things kind of came together today. And anyways, I'd love to come back. Yeah, you guys did great. Both of you. Thank you. All right. So let's rewind the clock. And the name of this podcast is called Finding Your Summit. And I was doing the research on you and I just kept going, oh my gosh, my gosh. And I knew you were accomplished. I knew who you were before you helped set up the pod Mm -hmm. with Laird. But the amount of things you've been able to accomplish are really mind blowing. And so congratulations to you on that. But I want to start with the fact that I know you were born in La Jolla, Mm -hmm. but then you moved to St. Thomas. Yeah. So why in the world would you move to St. Thomas? I had a roundabout path. My father's from Trinidad. My mother's from New York. They met in California. And then I was born in California because that's where they met. Yeah. I don't know that it was probably a really long romance. Yeah, yeah. And then... Oddly, my mother what, trained dolphins in Mexico City in a circus. And so I sort of one and a half, two years old, I was with her there and I got whooping cough. And so then actually a childhood friend of hers, a couple, they raised me in Long Island for five years without my parents. And in that time, my father actually passed away. And then my mom got... So, so let me jump in on that really quick because he didn't just pass away. He tragically died in a plane crash, right? Correct. He was flying himself and a girlfriend... I was five years old and here in California, he went to visit family for his birthday. And then the day before the weather was quite bad and they said maybe the plane got struck by something. And so he passed away. And then two years later, my mom met my then who was going to become my stepfather, who was from Puerto Rico. So they relocated from Boston to Puerto Rico. And then I met them. I was sent for basically yeah. at seven and moved down to Puerto Rico. And then they decided to live in St. Thomas, which is a basically a puddle jump away from Puerto Rico. Yeah. So you didn't really have any relationship with your father who passed away. Very briefly, he would come and visit me and he's been sort of the memory of him has been kept alive by his family. And I think I have some natural personality tendencies towards my father. Yeah. And I feel a a connection. But yeah, I mean, I didn't really grow up with a dad and my stepdad was a very loving and great guy, but he was more like a older friend. Because he's too nice to be uh, mean. and Yeah, no, I get that. Look, at my, I had a phenomenal relationship with my dad. And six years ago, he died of a massive stroke. And he was such a good guy. And his really his communication grid got blown out. And I would say the blessing of the whole thing is he passed away three months earlier or later. And mm. we had talked on many different occasions before that when everything was good and happy about if either of us ever found ourselves in a way that we're upside down. and. Yeah on life support or something that we just want to have the choice of call it. Right. Mm -hmm. And we did. And I can also say I'm super blessed that I was living in California at the time. And my best buddy next to me, Jim Mora was the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. And he happened to be driving. My dad had gone in the hospital yeah, and he was going to go in for the surgery on this next day. And I'd called Jim and I'd said, Hey, I'm just not feeling like something's right. Mm -hmm. And so would you mind stopping in? And he happened to be going right past this hospital. And so he went in and he called me. He goes, hey, he's asleep. I said, wake his ass up. So he woke up and he had a great relationship with my dad. And he was the last person to talk to him. That's great. It is great. And it's a blessing that he was the one to do that. And I'm sad like you are. I obviously had a longer relationship with my dad, but still there's a sense of loss there. right? Yeah. If I could be honest, I think because I wasn't living with my father, I didn't have it where he was coming home every day from work and then he wasn't. So I think the impact was a little easier in that way that he had not been an everyday part of my life. And then I think my understanding is it's almost in some ways easier when you lose someone when you're younger. Apparently, kind of your teenage years is the most impactful, the Mm -hmm. most challenging. But maybe in a certain way, I didn't have a chance to even really become overly attached to my dad. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, however you slice it. Yeah, I always say you get low cards and you get high cards. uh, Yeah, I mean, that's about finding your summit, right? There's multiple summits, right? Yeah, Yeah. well. There's people who live their whole life going, but I have threes and fours and you go, yeah, great. And you've got kings and aces. Well, we all do, right? And that's, again, I talk about this, the name of this podcast is Finding Your Summit. And I've had multiple summits. One of the summits was when Jim and I were playing at the University of Washington together on the football team and just trying to make it there and then yeah. make it in the NFL. And that was another summit. Sure. And then when I was married and raising kids, that was another summit. That's and a hell of a summit, that one, isn't it? It is. And we'll get into that here <laughs> shortly, right? So, but you've got so many things going for you. And I keep saying this, but it is true. 
How did you fall into, I mean, you've got a frame, you're almost as tall, probably maybe taller. I'm 6'3". I'm 6'3", yeah. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. you're tall, you're athletic, you crushed it at Florida State in terms Mm -hmm. of a volleyball scholarship. So where did the whole volleyball athletic thing come around? My mother's actually very, very athletic. She just was into swimming. I was fortunate. I mean, listen, I was six feet at 12. So I was in the Caribbean in through 10th grade. And there I had a couple people there. There was a coach named Kenny that used to drive me to volleyball practice. And so I started dabbling in volleyball then because I lived on an island. At times, there's just not a lot of productive stuff that you're into. Yeah. So I got moved out of the Caribbean when I was in 11th grade to Florida. And I went to a place called St. Petersburg. And so I showed up at a really small school called Keswick. It's like the tiniest school. Yeah. And they didn't have a lot of six foot three girls. Never mind that no, I wasn't well, well trained. Yeah, they could, period. They would have left and gone to a big high school, right? To be on big sports teams. Uh, yeah, yeah. To give you an idea, I went to the school from 11th and 12th grade. I was the first student to get a division one scholarship. Wow, that's small. It's small. Yeah. So I ended up kind of falling into volleyball, falling into basketball. I had a great basketball coach who was a great influence on me, this guy, Dean Souls, and used to take me to eat barbecue after or take me to church and tell me, couldn't I just get along with my mother and yeah. just did the right thing as a person. And I had a lot more offers for basketball than volleyball. And I just went to a BC camp, a blue chip camp and decided I think volleyball was going to be my thing. Yeah. You're an outside hitter, I assume. Middle. Middle. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And so, and then I remember telling my friends back home, like, oh, I'm going to college, first of all, which was weird coming from where I came from, right? We were all just thinking, oh, we'll get out in 12th grade and like work get some job. And I'm going on a first scholarship. And my friends back in St. Thomas were like, for what? And I was like, I know, weird, athletics. And I went to school at 17 and it was like a whole, my teammates, I think, because I went into a 12 person team, eight of us being freshmen. Hmm. So as coach can tell you, there's the pressure on your freshmen because they need to actually perform for you. So does that mean that you had a Obviously, there was a bunch of seniors that left, but was the team good at that time, Florida State? They were pretty good, but we had to be good. We didn't have the luxury of all these older classmates who were going to do it. The coach, the expectation was we had to also perform. I mean, you figure probably four of us had to perform. Yeah. So anyway, when I went through my first two days, I think everyone was like the under and over on me wasn't I wasn't going to make it just the way it was. I wasn't, you know, I had teammates that they were groomed from fifth, sixth grade. That wasn't me. But what I did do, I think, very well, and I think it's one of the pillars to me being able to navigate a lot of different things through life is I'm very coachable. And I had a really important coach. Cecile Renaud was a really important person for me because she was very fair, very strong, very demanding. But what she did as a coach, and this is the most important thing, is when she showed me when the time came that she was first interested in me and my well-being as a person. Hmm. And when you show that to an athlete, they'll do anything for you as a coach. We're going to war. I'm going for you because I know that you actually care about me, not just because I'm number whatever and I'm playing for you. And so... And by the way, that's the way this guy over here but was that's, to his players. I know. And that's a yeah. really... You know, coaches, I can understand, especially a game like football where you have so many athletes and you got to plug everybody in and get everything going. But how do you let these athletes know that first and foremost, I need you to develop and I need your life to be right as a person. And even at the cost of, I'm going to tell you, you're not allowed to play for me and I might need you. That moment is so important for an athlete. It's so cathartic because you go, oh, wait a second. It's bigger than, it's just bigger than the sport. So Cecile was all about that. So I went to Florida State, 17. Did you play your freshman year? I did. Yeah. And I was like, oh God, please. I don't want to make mistakes. Yeah. And then after my whole first freshman year, then I turned to 18, my second semester, I went to New York and I started going into fashion because I had the opportunity and it was to make a living because I had to be independent. So wait a minute, my recollection of the NCA, right? Well, legal holiday, summertime. That's right. So that's what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. This was your job. Summer. And well, that's the only reason I pursued it, right? So I was very fortunate. I went to so New I'm York. I'm working construction in Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> and I was a model in New York. Well, I'm in New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and I, I think was, your game was a little bit better than mine. Well, yeah. I was playing whatever cards I had, yeah. right? And I was like, oh, you'll pay me to show up or yeah. whatever. But listen, that wasn't easy either in the way that it's never a sure thing. So I worked in the summer. I actually did very well. And then I went back to Florida State for my sophomore year, two days, played on scholarship. And then I actually was hired on Thanksgiving Day 
to work for a gentleman named Herb Ritz, who was a very famous photographer. He since has passed away. We yeah, were doing British him, Vogue, yeah, sure. right? Yeah. So I had to work on Thanksgiving Day to stay legal. Yeah. And then after that semester, I gave up my scholarship yeah. and I paid to play because it wasn't worth it. I was going to NCAA tournaments. Other coaches were complaining or having me checked out. And it was a gamble. And this is where my coach, this is where Cecile really stepped in and said, because I had to take care of myself, mm -hmm. she also understood it was bigger than, oh, I'm trying to be a model. Yeah. It was like, no, this is, could set me up for my future or pay my bills. And she said, okay, here's our deal. I'll let you go for spring season. You can live in New York. So January, kind of through May, yeah. you got to come back for summer school. So I had to get enough credits to be eligible to play. Mm -hmm. She goes, and when you are here... So that meant when I'm there for season, you're here. You're all here. And when you're there, you're there. Yeah. And I would give up. I remember one time my sophomore year or junior year, I gave up a job for the weekend that was like 35 grand Yeah. because I was there. Yeah. And so she really helped me navigate that and personal accountability. And my teammates were not always kind. There was just a lot. I was very thankful for those lessons for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've got two daughters, right? You have three. Yeah. And so I know the way girls can be sometimes, especially with one. I've got the picture I just showed yeah. you of my one daughter. Maybe. She's a model yet, right? And so she's yeah. had some struggles here and yeah. there with other girls. Sure. So I get that. Back when I was playing, and we all have our own journey, our own path. Sure. And I was recruited at a lot of different options like you did. And I came to the University of Washington really on the upswing of that program in those days. I was 6'2", 181 pounds. I could not bench my weight. And the best thing that ever happened to me in my life was a couple things. Number one, this guy to my right, Jamora, was covering me. He's playing defense and he broke my foot. The only time in my life I've ever broken anything and he happened to break it. So I ended up in a cast for six months. I couldn't walk around. And I had to force myself. I'd never been in the weight room. Mm. And those were just also part of the times, like the whole high school club yeah, thing course. didn't exist, yeah. right? So it took me really three years. I redshirted my sophomore year. I didn't play my freshman year. I mean, I played mop-up time. Sure. But it allowed me to really understand what it takes in life to get from point A to point B and really see, I wouldn't call them mentors necessarily, but the older players who were really dialed in and they mm -hmm. had done all the things and they were all American at whatever, at some point in time in their life. So that stuff didn't matter anymore. It was like, this is a new game. Oh yeah. And if you want to play, you got to be like those guys. Yeah. And so it was just, Jim and I were talking about this on the drive in that I think the best thing that ever happened to me was that I had to sit because I don't think I'd be who I'd be today if I hadn't learned what really truly working hard is yeah. all about. Yeah. Well, you said a very important thing and this is true even in business. Once you get to a certain level, everybody was the best. And this is what's so tricky about coming from like a high school or even certain college levels, but usually college, especially high level college flushes this out. When you have the person who's physically the most talented, the problem for them is when they actually hit an adversity. Yeah. And how do you navigate that failure? How do you work through it? Because if they always just had this incredible, exceptional physical gift, then sometimes that worked against you. And when you get into these upper level environments, and again, even for work, everyone's smart. So who has the ability to problem solve? Who has the ability to deal with injury if you're in sports? Who has the ability to go and be honest with themselves and say, I'm not good enough right now. Yeah. How can I be better? And all these skill sets. And that's what's so fascinating for me because it's not usually the most talented person. When it gets dangerous, it's when it's the most talented person who also has the other, yeah. then they're unstoppable. So I was a late bloomer and it was really helpful. Going back to what you said earlier, you said at 12 years old, you're six foot. Yeah. So were you awkward still? Because still when you're sure. 17, I'm, you're I all, think I'm still awkward. Well, sometimes. you're not awkward, but you're, you know, <laughs> no, I saw you swim in the water. You're, I mean, it was beautiful to oh, watch, thanks. you know, like a fish, you know, <laughs> through navigating. But I think that we all kind of, your coordination based on size yes, and, I was, and everything else. I wasn't hyper awkward, but I certainly had doses of it, of course. My adversity is I saw a lot of dark times before I saw the light, right? Okay. And then when that hit, it hit, but I was prepared for it because mm -hmm. I'd been through this. Sure. So for you, seeing action as a freshman, yeah. did you go through any kind of adversity? Playing? Well, just your college experience. Well, no, I was just navigating two very different careers. Yeah. I was living in New York in a grown-up world, making grown-up money, and then coming back to school and having a coach say, not good enough, do it again. And having teammates sort of say, well, why do you get to not be at spring training and all that? 
and trying to mature as a person. And the other thing women do more than men is we apologize for everything. Yeah. We try at times, I think what I did was I tried to be less big, less good because I was... Trying to fit in. Yeah. And also, I've said this quite a bit. I know athletes that were groomed for success. Yeah. I was not groomed for anything. I barely had a standing family. I fumbled through with the grace and miracles. I ended up with some really important people influencing me. But once you get success or even little bits of it, if you're not groomed for it, you feel guilty, you feel weird, you feel shame. And it's a very unusual thing to know how to talk about. How do you say to somebody, this makes me really uncomfortable, even though this is what I want, because I don't know how to manage it. And none of us are worthy of it, but it's understanding that when you receive grace, that it's okay. And I don't know that it probably took me past my professional career as an athlete. Yeah. You know, so I was married for 24 years Mm -hmm. with my ex, now ex for 30. So I was totally in, totally committed. But my entire life of my playing, my accomplishments were all in a box in the garage. Yeah. And so when I ultimately, we split and I moved out and now I'm living in Sun Valley, not only do I have a vision board of where I'm going, mm-hmm. of all these pictures of mountains I've been on, and but also for my football stuff, it's so important, right, to acknowledge that, like you're talking about, to bring that in and say, it's okay, right? And yeah. You don't have to be conceited about it but also grateful on some of the paths that you've been on. So you know where you're going and it's okay. And you're not feeling guilty that you are who you are. And so that's hard, right? Because not everyone gets to do what they love to do. And so if you're at all empathetic to the world that you live in, you're aware of that. However, you're wasting what is being given to you if you don't kind of go for it. Have you ever met a guy who's like a master black belt something at whatever? There's a stillness, right? Yeah. And I think because if there's a knowingness of I'm sort of good at one thing, I know how to protect myself. And even having yielded to someone else, having humbled out many, many times, yeah. I think that that's what you can bring from your past. You've been in war. You've yeah. played football. And I think sometimes just knowing that you can survive that You can come up for that if you need to. However we get that, I think that that's what travels with you. Yeah, no, for sure. Were you able to go back to that coach you were talking about and relate to her? Because part of what you're talking about is relatability to other people who didn't really know what you were going through. And so now you're trying to play down versus go up, right? I think she, because she was a coach, had this idea of it's all coaches. They understand what you can be before you can. And I think she always knew that about me. I don't think it's all coaches, but I think I mean, great, sorry, great coaches. Like when a great coach looks at you and says, you can do this in that moment, you believe them more than you believe yourself because they're seeing something about you that you don't even know about yourself yet. Sure. And so she had that. She, listen, she's a very good friend of mine Yeah. and we're completely different people, but I respect her so much and her work ethic and She has no children. And I call her every Mother's Day. And I said, listen, you are a mother to a lot of people. Yeah. To a lot of women. A lot of times, going back to that stillness you were just talking about with people who are in martial arts or whatever. I mean, it's just at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you do. You got to have a strong sense of self. But real self? See, this is where I'm at now. And I've been maybe for a few years. This is the thing, though. All of it's unsustainable. All of it. To be number one, to be the best. Yeah. I was here. I was... It's unsustainable. So how do I come to the place where I feel the same about myself, regardless of what's going on in my exterior world, especially work, right? Because work, it's like, I'm doing good. Oh, I'm good. I'm not doing good. I'm not good. How do we find the real opinion of ourselves that's true and authentic? Because that's the only thing that is sustainable. And I think the other way that that's helpful, it's like you guys having this long-term friendship is building meaningful relationships so that if you're doing good, your friends are like, you know what? I'm so happy for you. You're going through a hard time. They're like, yo, I love you and I'm here for you. But it's not different. You're not better than or less than because of something external. And so for me, that is the ultimate because that's the only thing that's sustainable. Everything else is BS. I could not. Yeah. So for Jim and I, we've got this thing called trail talk, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of problems solved on the trail. Mm -hmm. But really to unlock that for me, it took me 50 years to figure this out. That's what a blockhead I am. Sure. And I found this, my bucket was so empty 
And I was trying to figure out really how I could like refill and I needed a big goal and I wanted to do something athletically great. I knew I still couldn't go back and play football. Right. So what could that be for me growing up in Seattle, a very mountainous community? Jim and I both know a lot of mountaineers that have done the seven summits and Everest many times. And so I was like, I want to become that guy that climbs these, the NFL guy to first guy to ever climb the seven summits. I right. want to be that guy. And that would be a great, and I didn't tell anybody about it. And so I set sail and I go down to Tanzania to mm-hmm. climb Kilimanjaro, mm-hmm. which I've been on twice now. And so I was going up and I was struggling. And anyways, where I'm trying to go with this is that like the magic key that unlocked it for me after I was struggling on summit day that I made it to the top, then I was coming back down. All of a sudden these tears were just streaming out of my eyes uncontrollably and I couldn't stop. I didn't cry since I was like 11. That's right. how like broken in that sense I was, right? Sure. And, and football had been such a gladiator sport and I thought, strength and power of just like how tough you are. And when I finally figured out about being vulnerable as a guy, right? Mm -hmm. Women are so much better about opening that faucet and letting those things go and talking Mm -hmm. to their girlfriends. And maybe that's why women in general live longer. I don't know. But for me, it's like I started sharing my thoughts and my feelings with other people Mm -hmm. and it just helped my conversations go deeper And it's just like, hey, if you don't want to go there, totally cool. But that's where you really find truth. And so then bouncing back to what you were just talking about, if you really have a strong sense of who you are and what you're doing, all the other stuff around you, whether it goes high or low in between. I was on Denali. I mean, this is just a frivolous thing. But I was on Denali last year. It was minus 60 degrees and we didn't make it. So I didn't make it. So I didn't make it. Whatever. I got to go back and do it again. Yeah. So I'm heading out. But that or relationships or my relationships with my daughters, which is so incredibly important to me. Mm-hmm. It's just made life so much richer just being this way. And it's just like, I am who I am. Yeah. And actually I have a theory about men because of living with a pretty masculine <laughs> male for 22 years right. plus is I actually think that men's capacity is different than women. So women will cry more freely, yeah. if you will, right? Or like, oh, and that's so sad. And yeah. But I actually think that men feel it deeper and longer because also like, for example, if like if all the wheels come off the bus, I have to still have breakfast for my kids in the morning. Yeah. Right. And what I've learned from Laird is because Laird is so hyper masculine, he is way more feeling and sensitive than I am. And I think that that is actually the harmony. That's where the beauty is. And people misconstrue that that men are not sensitive. And I actually think quite the opposite because it's, what do they say? To be a true warrior, one must be compassionate, right? So I think men have that. I mean, think about helpfulness, protectiveness, all this stuff. It comes from that place as well. And so for men to think, oh, I can't show my feelings because it seems weak. It's actually, I think, really contrary. So there's all this stuff on here that I could jump into, but I don't feel like it. Then do whatever you feel. Okay. It's your show. Isn't that great? Yeah, absolutely. You're so, driving. No, well, since we're on this thread, let's go down this path. So you wrote a book mm. called My Foot is Too Big for the Glass Slipper. Yes. So <laughs> I want to talk to you about that book. Okay. And I want to talk to you about, since you brought it up, your relationship with Laird. And I'm very open about my situation with my ex. And she's a wonderful person. Yeah. And one thing I want to applaud you on is that even though you guys had your struggles, but you're still married. Mm-hmm. And you guys were able to work those. You could sort it out however you sorted it out, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's probably one of the great failures of my life. And when I said I do, I meant I do forever. And there's some things you control and there's other things you can't. And wonderful person, no infidelity, no hitting, fighting. I mean, none of that stuff. But it's just like sometimes you just grow apart and go in two different directions. And so for you, mm-hmm. how were you able to like patch that whole thing back together? Mm -hmm. Right. Because we've had two sort of, I would say, meaningful cross sections, kind of one sort of, I would say I would take the accountability for and then Laird had moments where he had to make some real choices. Right. Here's what I know. I will give him a lot of the credit in this way, which is he's very courageous in being loving and vulnerable way more than I. We're just different. And so Laird is the person who taught me like, Hey, if we're going to do it, you kind of got to put your head on the chopping block. It's uncomfortable, but if we're really going to do it, we got to do it. Yep. And the other thing that he does very well that I have since picked up in the last 15 years or so is each day, if I had too many weird looks on my face or there was a weird tone, Laird doesn't just let it go. It's, Hey, what's up? 
right away. He's continuously clearing the decks all the time with everybody, everywhere he is. That's how he functions. Yeah. He's not afraid to make you uncomfortable. He's not afraid to be uncomfortable. He isn't afraid to get into it. And I don't mean like, it's not our yelling and the whole thing. He's just not, it doesn't bother him to talk about things that are highly uncomfortable, hmm. which are feelings. Yeah. So I would say that has a lot to do with it. And something really important that I try to stress for women, especially is through the entire process of being with Laird and Laird is a very strong personality with a big life and all the stuff around him is I knew it was going to be important for me to keep who I was in some way. And so as I'm someone's wife and someone's mother, I still had something that was of me because I understood very clearly and early, it wasn't Laird's job to make me happy. And I think that happens to a lot of women and they're well-intended. They go into it going, hey, I'm going to serve the family. I'm going to raise the kids. I'm going to serve my guy. And in that way of like, I'm going to do my job. And then they turn late 40s and 50s. And I talked about this in my book. And then you're pissed because the kids move out and they move on and they have a life and your guy's life is still big and going. Yeah. And then you go, nobody appreciates me. I've been forgotten and I'm angry. And also now, how the hell do I start again? It's kind of what happened to me. Well, it's not unusual, right? Yeah. And so what I did do, I think, unknowingly, but intuitively was I knew I would get eaten alive by Laird and his life if I didn't fortify and hold on to my voice, my opinion, myself on some level, because I knew it was still ultimately my job to make myself happy. It's not my kid's job. I'm not defined by them. My job is to take care of them and love them. They don't owe me anything. And even the same with Laird. So I think both of us clearly have enough healthy selfishness to take care of that side of our yard, if you will. So are you talking about for you, and this is all the other stuff that I told you I wasn't going to get into, but yeah. I'll just mention about your ESPN, these different co-hosting things that you do, writing yeah. books, being in movies, being a mom, yeah. these different projects that you put yourself yeah. in. Because also if Laird, let's say he gets hit by a lightning bolt and meets a 35-year-old woman and he's got to go. I mean, weird things have happened, yeah. right? Or whatever. And this probably has to do with my childhood, uh, but I can't be in this relationship because I don't have a choice. I have to be in this relationship each day because I want to be. And I want him to understand the only reason he's here is because he wants to be. And then it works well. And if Laird, anything, God forbid, ever happened, I still have to stand. I can't fall apart. Yeah. And I love my husband very passionately, like in a very deep way, but I still have to do that too. Yeah. It's not in a disconnected way. Well, that makes you a better person is what you're saying. It just works for me, but yeah. also, and then I'm not looking and leaning to him like, well, how come you have all these things that you're excited about that turn you on and I'm here and I'm kind of like, I'm not feeling these things. He can't fix that. I just knew it would be easier to keep the fire at least lit a little bit, like when the kids are really small and you're on like on heavy mom duty, yeah. keep that fire lit just a little bit so that when they get bigger, I can blow a little more air on that thing, get it bigger again, but not let it go all the way out. Well, the other thing too, from a guy's standpoint is I think it makes the other person much more interesting, right? Well, yeah. It's called checks and balance. Too. Yeah. It's checks and balances. Mm -hmm. It's, it's human nature, right? Like if I think, I mean, listen, and Laird is an incredible husband, but I think if he sort of thought, oh, she's in my back pocket, even though he's the best guy, yeah. he's not going to probably treat me as well as if he thought I probably should stay in my A game. And it's not a game. It's a checks and balance. And it doesn't have to do always like there could be someone listening at home and think, well, they're the ones who work and I've decided to stay home. It's not just about money. It's about the other person understanding if I don't really take care of this situation and I don't come up and bring my a game, the way I talk to them, the way I treat them, they probably will leave. That's not the worst thing in the world. Well, so my thing started to slide off the tracks about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And we've been not married now for three. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this with complete conviction that I would have never wished what I went through in the last 10 years on anybody. But so many blessings have come out of this. Climbing mountains, mm -hmm. newsletter, website, huge social following, talking to you. I mean, there's so many people and the gratefulness that I've been able to share on talking to people 
that are deaf and they're on America's Got Talent mm-hmm. and no arms and no legs and kayaking down the Colorado River. They're blind. I mean, mm-hmm. so many of these people, I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? Is you're communicating. And so I would have never come to this place hadn't I gone through this situation. And that's just the cards that were dealt for me. That's mm-hmm. the ones of the twos. But on the flip side, it's the ace that you talked about earlier, right? Yeah. On the blessing that has come as a result of going through my adversity. Yeah. Where I'm here today. So I really agree. There's another thing that I wanted to bring up. So there's a gal that I had on my pod months ago. Her name is Laura Doyle. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this book called The Submissive Wife. Mm -hmm. Something like that, right? Yeah. And so I was like, okay, so we got to talk about this title, Mm -hmm. right? And so That word. Yeah. And so (laughs) this is something that you've brought up. Mm -hmm. And in the way you like your point of view and Laura's point of view is 100% right on the money. And if you could explain that to the audience sure. on what that means from your definition, because I think that actually puts you in a complete position of power mm-hmm. and strength, not that you're this submissive person. Mm-hmm. Well, I did. There was a line in the book and the way it's in the context, it's like, okay, ready, here we go. I'm going to say it. That what I realized, and I was never taught this, so I had to learn it through bumping my head against the wall a few times, which came more naturally to me, took on the feminine role within our home. And submissive meaning service, not doormat. Yeah. That the dynamic worked well. Because Laird is such a generous person and he'll do anything for you. And it's really so simple. He would like to go chase the surf if it's going to be up and know that you're behind him 100%. Yeah. He likes me to make him dinner and I like to cook. Yeah. And if I didn't like to cook, he'd say, let's go have dinner. Yeah. And he wants regular intimate contact. He wants to have a regular sex life and he wants to be respected. I always say I don't talk to anyone better than I talk to Laird. I am very mindful of the way I talk to him. And so what happens is it's what, it's three or four things. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? And some people and other dynamics, I was merely sharing our dynamics. Other guys, it's like, that's not what they're interested. I have friends and this is true. They really want their chick to be like super hot and dressed up and polished and nails. And that's what they will like. They want all that. And I have friends that are really high powered guys. They would like that their wives are a little bit ball crushers. Yeah. It's like the one person in their life that doesn't say yes to them. Right. I have those friends too, where they kind of like, or they want to save somebody, right? I'm going to come in and rescue or whatever their dynamic is. But between us, I was saying, Hey, listen, I feel like I'm pretty masculine in the world. I feel like I'm very alpha work, this and that. Within this very nuanced relationship with my husband, I realized that I wanted to also be able to express that side of myself. And so he was the guy I was going to do it with. Yeah. And I got a lot of heat for it. And this is what I've learned. I was a child of Title IX. I went to school in a scholarship, athletic, on a full ride. Okay. I didn't have to fight for that right. When I played volleyball, I actually made as much or more than my male counterparts. Mm -hmm. When I was in fashion, I got paid 20 times with male models. So there are certain fights I didn't have to participate in. So I totally honor the women before me, but it was sort of like a different conversation of, okay, now we're here. Everything's so modern. We're all equal. Women are making their money. What if you want to live with an alpha guy? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And people can say whatever they want. They can say, well, men should. Yeah. Okay. Sure. How about the way that it really is? How about their biology? How about the way their brains work? How about all these things that are just kind of how it is? And I opted for that. Laird will take care of me on the things I'm not able to do. If it all comes down, I want to be with Laird. Well, I think it gets down to two things. Number one, and Laura made this point in our conversation with her and in her book, but you know, I really didn't think about it in these terms, but since we've had the conversation, I've thought about this a lot, but the number one thing that guys want is respect from their woman. Yeah. Right. And well, what, the other thing is they want to be nurtured, not mothered. That's right. That's right. And I see another thing that bugs me is when I go, Hey, do you want to go golfing or something? One of my buddies and I'm like, let me go, you know, ask the wife if I can go do that. A lot of guys get into that. And it's mother. a bad dynamic. It's, it's not dynamic. sexy by the way. No. Hey, can I go play golf? Uh, no, we're not going to do that today because yeah. you know, it's like people say that to yeah. me. Oh, do you let Laird? I go, first of all, let's get this clear. I don't let Laird. Laird is his own person. I'm not yeah. his mother. I think another really important thing too, is that in the world that we live in, and I bring this into my outside life too, is yielding and service. Yeah. I don't need to be first. 
you can go ahead of me. Because I believe that if I'm going to try to be some level of mastery in some way, I have to put other people first. Mm -hmm. I know how to get mine, so to speak. I can run over people's head and get be first. But where's the mastery in that? The mastery is in participating and making wherever you are better. And you got to participate in that. And considering or being around and noticing other people around you and seeing what's happening and all of that, I think that we don't teach that. And I think that that's really important. And that's also the tone in which I bring into my marriage, which is why would I not have a partner that then I'm actually actively trying to make their life better? Why would I not do that? Why bother? Why would I have you come into my house and then be like trying to give you a bunch of hell and make it more difficult for you? Now, it doesn't mean I don't know how to stand up for myself. I certainly do. You're not saying that though. You're just saying that what you're going to bring to the table. That's all I'm in charge of. I can't yeah. be in charge of Laird. Yeah. Now, if Laird makes bad choices for a couple of years, I might be like, yo, it was great. Let's figure out the co-parenting thing. Yeah. I'm good. You're not taking care of your side, but I'm not in charge of that. It's the same with people. If they decide they want to act badly, it will take a long time for me to exert my will. So as I mentioned, I went through 10 years of really having to look inside, mm -hmm. right? And own up to like my own faults and everything. And I've just come to the place in my life where I don't want good. I don't want great. I want phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you enter into that, you have to bring everything you got to the table and make sure that you're feeding, you're doing what you can. But so much of about is about attitude, so much of about being just grateful and conscientious mm -hmm. about the other person and having that true partnership and something that you said before, and it sounds like Laird is a little bit more in charge of this, not in charge, but he's good in this dynamic. And that is when something comes up, really trying to nip it in the bud, get it out in the open, mm -hmm. communicate about it. Communication is the key of life, right? Yeah. And to have that dynamic somebody, it can go upside down when things aren't communicating the right way. And you're yeah. saying one thing and they're hearing something else and they're going, wait a minute, something's not right here. Yeah. And another thing I learned, and I was very prideful and Laird taught me is, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a very hard thing to say, but even if let's say you and I are having a disagreement and I could be 90% right, let's just say, yeah. it's very female of me to do that, right? Yeah. That 10%, <laughs> if you have a point within your 10%, right? Yeah. I have to be willing to look at that. Not, oh, I'm right, I win. But what in that 10% that you said, could I learn from to be better? That's a valid point. And I think that the minute I learn to stop defending ground, that really is also helpful. But you have to be with someone you trust that they don't beat you over the head with it. That's the other side of it. It's if I'm willing to say to you, you know what, I've blown it or I didn't mean to talk that way. I'm sorry. They have to protect you. They can't beat you up. Yep in the interim. So it, again, it still has a two-way thing, but you can still be responsible for your side. But we have to protect each other. There has to be kindness. You can call each other out and still be kind. And by the way, when someone says, I blew that, I'm sorry, and you say, okay, guess what? It's over. You don't get to bring it up again. Yeah. Because you said, okay. If you said, hey, I'm not ready, I'm going to get there, oh. but I'm not there today. That's cool. Yeah. But don't say, okay, and then get out that bat later. So I think within that too, then the expectation isn't, oh, my partner's always going to be perfect. The expectation becomes my partner has my best interests at heart and they are going to try to protect me and I feel safe. Tell me if you agree with this. What? I think men and women both bring different dynamics to the table, sure. right? And I think guys are better, in my opinion, at like you're pissed, something's going on, you deal with it and you move on and it doesn't come up again. I think women hold on to stuff and want to revisit yes. it much more. What's well, the way we, our brains work? And also men, because they're physically, let's say from a biological standpoint, I think are bigger, stronger, can protect themselves more. They don't have to remember every little detail because they're capable of protecting themselves. Yeah. I think what it was meant for originally, it's like when they say gossip was actually meant to be a form of communication in the village to let everybody know who's safe and unsafe. It turned into other things. I think initially those traits, which I agree with you, was for a woman to be really clear to understand, to remember, hey, what isn't going to be safe or good for me or the children has turned into, Laird, what does he say? Unforgetting and unforgiving. Yeah. That's yeah. how it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why, I mean, I always laugh when I talk about being submissive, but part of my brain is much more masculine. Yeah. 
And so it's like, that's easier for me to just get on with it. But again, I think you have to look at the whole thing. It's sort of like having a goal. And why don't I eat the chocolate cake today? Because the chocolate cake doesn't serve the end goal. Yeah. So if I'm in this relationship and the end goal is like, I'd like to be pretty, have a sense of happiness. And I'd like when Larry comes home, he doesn't dread opening that front door, but goes like, oh, I'm home. Yeah. Besides the chaos of family, which is normal. Yeah. Is everything I say and do, how is that serving the end goal? And me beating you over the head, my partner that I sleep next to at night, why would I do that? So I think it's also getting, having enough self-control and having expansiveness to look and step back and go, what is it that I want? And what is it that I want to give? And what do I want them to experience? And then going from there, not just walking around reacting. Yeah. I've got this stupid saying. I've got a lot of them. Okay. Here, I'll give you one of them. Right. There's a big difference between willing and want. Yeah. We all want to be a millionaire or the this or that or everything else, but are you willing to do what it takes? And these things all take work. And everything you've talked about yeah. today all evolve this little word called effort and yeah. mindset. Well, and a little bit of self-restraint. I hate to say it. Yeah. Like there are those moments that you want to... And you go, oh, feel so good because I'd be right for like a whole 10 seconds. But I think, again, it's that end, the bigger, the long goal, the big picture. I love that. So just give me like what the bottom line about the glass slipper was all about. Well, okay. So ultimately why I wrote that book was I wanted to figure out why do women not have the time to eat a little better and move occasionally? And that's really boring to talk about. So then I was like, cool, let's get into life a little bit and show how if we're not worried about showing, you know, creating uh, four-year-old theater birthday parties that are perfect, that we would have more time to move. And if the expectation amongst one another wasn't that everything was perfect, my hair's perfect, my nails are perfect, but we actually put that energy into training, we probably would look better yeah. or feel better than allowing ourselves to enjoy who we are more. And so the whole idea was trying to encourage, especially females, not to lose their voice in the process of marriage and childhood, but also trying to give them some insight into men a little bit, just some small cues, because I have learned a lot from Laird and I think he's a great example, just to share that information, but also share it about marriage, because sometimes they don't tell you. And so you, you read little girls, the books about the white horse, and then she's supposed, she thinks the wedding is the moment and then the baby's the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she's wildly disappointed. Yeah. And I was like, why don't we have a real conversation about it? and share. And that was it. And at the end of the day, that was sort of my hope. I love that. Before we leave, mm -hmm. I want to plug this Laird Superfood mm -hmm. that you're involved in. Mm -hmm. I had this green tea with, I don't know what's in there, some kind of creamer. And it was one of the best things I've ever put in my mouth. This is a lightning in a bottle. Laird's been a coffee connoisseur for a really super long time. And he was doing coconut oil and red palm. Paul Check, do you know who Paul Check is? I don't. He's a genius he's more than a trainer, but he was putting ghee in his coffee 20 years ago yeah. with Laird. They'd be downstairs psychoing out with caffeine and ghee. <laughs> and then we had somebody running a different business. Laird was doing this gentleman and he would see the guys come over and like, Hey, Laird, can you make me a coffee? And he's like, how hard can it be? Got everything into a powder form. And it's really authentic a reflection of Laird's real life. This is the stuff he uses. So it's, there's turmeric creamer, there's regular, it's gluten-free, it's vegan, it's dairy-free. And the whole notion behind it is, hey, if you're going to drink coffee every day, is there a way you can do it that it's better for you? And it's that simple. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And we're going to plug this on the pod. Jim, do you have any questions over here for Gavin? Oh, yeah, Jim. I've listened to a lot of his pods. You're yeah. amazing. Oh, thank I've you. I've listened to a lot of people and I've met a lot. You're amazing. I want to read you one quote, though. Please, I'm ready to hear. Please. Because you said something when you were talking about your coach. Yeah. And how she believed whatever she believed you would be, you would be. So you know who Joe Paterno is? Of course. Joe is yeah. now deceased and he went through a, he some turmoil at the end of yeah. his career, but he's a great coach. And he said this, your players tend to become what they believe you think they are. They pick up on a coach's words and body language. If you don't believe in them, they'll know it and they'll perform that way. Yeah. I thought that was exactly what you were talking about. But that's right. Coach. Yeah. And yeah. now that was nothing compared to the other stuff you said, but that caught my attention. I Amazing. think that's important. And I have to even remind myself as a parent sometimes that like, sometimes I'm going through the real small details with the girls and it almost seems naggy and like weird. And then right before I walk away, there are times where I'm like, I know it's all going to get figured out. I so believe in you and love you. And then I just walk away because sometimes I realize I'm breaking it down so much 
that they're not understanding the most important thing that I need them to understand from whichever place they're navigating from, which is you're going to do it. You're going to have the right North Star. You're going to learn to really trust yourself because that's the most important thing. We're going to get there. So it's like this in and out thing and it's very difficult. But parenting, if that's a whole other topic, it's but been the most humbling. you said applies to everybody. Yes. You're going to get it. Trust your gut. Be all you can be. I mean, so many of these different things just apply to everybody that's out there. I mean, I personally feel, and I'm looking at your life, and I feel like you, both you and Laird are on the same plane. So is this guy over here, Jim? But I feel like I haven't really accomplished anything. And my life is just getting going. I mean, I got so many projects that are out in front of me yeah. that I haven't done. And I'm so excited about that. And that helps, you know, create the drive and the goals and the motivation. And you talked about the chocolate cake. That doesn't serve me about where I'm ultimately trying to be and go. And my two girls... One just graduated from USC Amazing. Uh, last week and the so other did, one... We were there too. Were you there? My daughter graduated from USC oh, last really? week. Yeah, I was just glad she was in a small major. We were on the backfield, well, <laughs> the small one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were, both of our daughters went to USC and they both graduated in That's the amazing. school of Annenberg. And so Oprah... Oh yeah. Yeah, was Great. the speaker. Uh, amazing. It was incredible. Amazing. That's just amazing, incredible. And she had these fantastic things to say about caring and being humble and kind and all these different... Yeah roadmaps to life to impart this knowledge upon all these kids that are going out in the world and doing these great things. But I say this all the time, it truly does take a village. So you're doing all the right things. Larry's doing all the right things. Jim's doing all the right. I'm doing, but also friends and professors and all these other things that yeah. help nourish them. And we're just, well, cause by the guide. way, by the way, like if you ask my children and everyone reacts differently to different parenting styles, right? One of my daughters in particular I've had to learn and change so many ways that I do it. And it might work for my other two, but it doesn't work for her. Mm. And instead of fighting it or saying, this is the way I do it, it's also understanding that our children, when they talk about teachers, they are here to kind of show us like, yeah, you thought that works. And that system works for almost everything else you do in your life. But in this scenario, you might have to make adjustments. Yeah, that's well said. And it's tricky. Yeah. All right. Well, this interview has not been tricky. And (laughs) I can honestly tell you, it's been one of the more fulfilling ones I've done. Oh, thanks. And I really appreciate you being transparent and honest and just putting it out there and continued success. And I really do want to come back when I get back from Denali. Okay. Well, you guys, by the way, both of you did so well. And I want you to come back. Then we can start to layer it. And what you don't realize too, it's like this for anyone who tries anything new and the water's even the kind of the scariest, I think. Yeah. Now your brain will go and process all this information, whether subconsciously and consciously. Yeah. And the next time you come, it will be exponentially easier. Yeah. It's a mind game. And Laird always says there's only one first time. Yeah. Yeah. That's all true. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Aloha. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N nfl.com so until the next podcast just remember clear eyes full hearts and remember it takes a little more to make a champion so make it happen thank you bye